<laughs> start with a, with a mission, which is slightly renewed and reinforced by the four acts of the fighter board. We are, we are the steward of the open source definition, and an emphasis on steward means that we don't define the definition in a vacuum. We maintain it for the community. So if the community wants to change it, like so many people are yelling at me on Twitter angrily all the time, you can change it. And we are a public charity company, which is something that I Reinforced, especially because so many, many other corporations, organizations, non-profits, are still a non-profit, but they work and, and behave like a trade association. association. We, we are, by definition, about our bylaws and the fact that we are incorporated in the United States as a 501 c 3 and we are working in the interest of the public in general, not of the members of the sponsors. And this is a key distinction that is worth highlighting. Because, because again, again people, people yell at me on Twitter saying, saying you can find money from Google, Google to find money from Microsoft, Microsoft. therefore you represent Microsoft and Google, which is not true. true. Technically and practically, I speak, speak badly about often when, often when I need to. And, and historically, I've been, been on the other side of the fence for a long time. I've been, been protesting against the privatization of corporations, corporations before I joined the office. And, and our mission, mission is, our, our vision is to be the leading voice for, for all the debt recoveries around, uh, policies and principles of the open source. And, and we, we want to help the ecosystem to, to, to thrive, building new business practices and, and coalesce best practices and ideas in, in open source for, for the collaboration and for the, the, the benefit of the, the community that is going to be benefiting. The society as a whole. And, and the other part, part of our vision is that we want to build bridges. So, so collaborate across different industries, between academia and research in society, policymakers who don't really have a mission. I think it's, it's a very global and global and wide mission. And then despite being established in the United States, we do have a global bridge. So, so what we do, do in the practice, we maintain the open source, source definition and we will review licenses according to the principles embedded in the open source definition. And then we've been doing this for 25 years and then for a lot of activities for a long time. In terms of projects, we do maintain the design, which is what we'll talk about in a little bit more. We do have uh, a more events and educational activities like. like Series that we've been doing on the investigating night, which we'll talk about later. And the and other two areas, areas of activities are monitoring and working with policy makers to establish people to review it and help them establish policies that they don't hurt the uh, ecosystem and actually promote and facilitate collaboration across industry and across borders. And we help reviewing the standards and making our systems. Like, like we, we are, are members of standard, standard setting, setting organizations like SC, ISO, ISO like the and Sensei, like the and others, making, making sure that when the standards are set and, and, uh, and then adopted, adopted they, they, include, include, they, they don't include, include provisions that would prevent implementation of the standard that is open source And it's a really crucial piece of activity that is not really visible because a lot of the conversation happens in standard setting groups are secret. But, but our, our membership allows for that, that activity to happen and, and damage, damage not spread. spread. Quick, Quick reminder, reminder, the open source definition, I used to call it a poor worded, worded way of the four freedoms, freedoms of the software foundation. foundation. Fundamentally, they're the same, but, but the checklist, checklist of the open source definition is a little bit more practical and what we use the, the, the community, community to say to um, review licenses, licenses as they come in. And, and it's really, really just, just a checklist. One, One couple of interesting, interesting points, points to highlight here is the two points, points of non-discrimination non -discrimination of a person or a few people in general. These have been coming often under stress and under the talk in the recent world because, because um, the, 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 well, well, they're, they're, they're coming under the talk. 
and the reason why we are trying to remember that is because the open source definition has enabled a single effect flow of an network effect that allows for cooperation software provision, for example, in a very clean way, very clean way, and very simple way. If you download a package into my library from an NPM and you send it a license called something with a code, and that code corresponds to a license name that has been approved by your social media, for example, SSPDX, or something like that, they that definition, you know. That, that the code that you're downloading runs you those 10 commands, runs you those 10 frequencies. Without, without it, without any of those 10, you, you must ask for You must involve your, your legal, legal department, department and they, they must check individually, individually the licensing terms and, and see if you're allowed to use them or not. Because, because it's, it's very crucial, crucial because, because in the past, the past few years, years there, there have been, been more and more, and more, and more, and more, 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 um, corporations, independent people, individuals, have been telling us that the open source, the word open source, is not directly tied to the open source definition because, well, you have no trademark. Well, we may not have the trademark, but the thing is that once you start polluting the definition and you start polluting the, the meaning of the word that, for example, this conference carries and understand very easily that open source is software that has been licensed with a license that has been approved by the open source initiative, then you're creating, you're creating doubt, you're creating friction inside the environment, and you're creating troubles down, down the line. And these, these ambiguity, these troubles that these groups have been putting are, are dangerous, and we need to take um, really good care of defending the common understanding of what open source means. The, uh, and, and the reason for this is because the validation that open source means what has been approved by the open source initiative comes not just comes from a very wide understanding, even policymakers. So these are top level government organizations that understand and assign to the open source initiative, to the list of licenses that we approve, assign the, the value of, of the organization that I represent. Uh, you know, the Italian government, the UK government, even the European Union, without saying explicitly because they can't, but once they presented, a, they, they developed a new license for, to use for all the open source, all the software developed and released by European uh, Institute, the European Commission, European Union institutions, the European line license, European Union public license, they wanted us to approve it, and they celebrated when we approved it. So, delegating to us that import the the importance and the trust um, for the authority. So. Um, so how we're going, how we are maintaining the, the definition, and how are we responding to these to these uh, common threats, but also how we, you're maintaining this authority by doing, you know, but doing what we're doing in in a very humble way. So we we want to maintain and keep keep on enforcing the the definition to maintain this honesty in advertising, meaning. We have noticed a lot of, um, when we notice corporations or groups that are using the licenses, uh, creating new licenses, and then in their GitHub repository, Git repositories, or on their uh, publicity material, their, their advertising material, they call it open source, then we nicely go back to them and say, please, you know, be nice. Yeah, open source is not what you mean this by this, call it something else, but be, be true. Um, and uh, luckily, we're also starting to see courts um, noticing this and, and assigning the, uh, you know, reinforcing the meaning of the word open source as using a license, license that has been approved by the open source initiative. Um, so we, so we, we're going around and monitoring this. 
um, being being very very active. And um, the other way that we're doing this is by working with uh, having this project called Clearly Defined. Um, Clearly Defined is is um, a, a repository of metadata that increases the information that is available into individual packages inside the largest package managers like in npm and pipeline that has come to mind where a lot of the, the these package managers don't have a strong enforcement of licenses information inside the packages so individual developers can pretty much slap any any in any way or form nobody's gonna ch nobody checks whether the licenses are correctly applied inside the repositories and they get distributed what what mm, Clearly defined as is to provide an additional layer of information that is crowdsourced information, vetted and valid, validated by by the maintainers of the metadata repository, so that your CI/CD, your SBOM material, uh, you know, um, software, uh, your um, uh, your scanners, your license scanners can rely on this information more cl more clearly. And we are reinforcing this project as four years old, it's in production at Microsoft, Bloomberg, uh, we know Siemens and SAP also are big users of it. And we are hiring a community manager for this. So if anybody is interested in working with us, um, let me know, reach out. And the other activity that we're doing to uh, reinforce our and, and reinforce our understanding of the licensing information is to look at new technologies, how those new technologies are affecting the 10 principles of open source, uh, of the open source definition. AI is one of the new technologies that is deeply changing how concepts of data uh, and software and source code um, are intertwined and uh, mixed in a, in a way that the software that we had in mind when we wrote the open source definition uh, didn't, doesn't have. So we, we launched this event, uh, which is a, in three parts. It's ongoing, it's still not over. The first part is a series, uh, uh, it's a podcast uh, series. And I highly recommend to listen it, uh, to five episodes and with interviews with experts to kind of that will un set the stage for the second part, which is happening next month, panel conversations, four panel discussions with uh, three to four experts, each of the panels. And we will dive a little bit deeper into the aspects of legal. So what's what's um, the legal status of, of a model? What What's the, since it's not covered by copyright, most likely, what is it under? How do you understand whether you can share it or or modify it and how to modify it, which will be also addressed into uh, from the business perspective, from the perspective of researchers and academia, and finally from the civil society, us, as the, um, the, the ones who will be judged by, by the AI, whether we are deserving a loan or not, then what are the rights that we should be exercising? Um, and this comes from my experience from when open source started to become a thing. And we had an answer to the politicians that were starting to deploy digital systems to interact with citizens. Like if you wanted to apply for a credit card on one hand or for, for an, an ID card and you needed to go to a website and the, only, the website was only available for people using Microsoft Windows with Internet, Internet Explorer and ActiveX uh, plugins. So the combination of that proprietary software to interact with citizens, we had an answer. We said, look, you have to be able to interact with citizens with open source software. Now, if we say to the, to the policymakers, you have to have, if someone is denied a loan, you have to give them, you have to give the citizens what? And that's why we're doing deep dive AI. On the policy front, we're working with, uh, we've been working in Europe for multiple years now, um, but we're also expanding our uh, reach. Uh, we hired, we announced that we hired this week a US policy director, Deb Bryant. She's a known, uh, very well known uh, leader of open source projects. 
and uh, she will be working um, a lot with uh, uh, local institutions in the United States, local agencies, and also federal agencies to teach them about how the value of compliance, the value of open source collaboration, and how to do open source. Because if there is one thing where I know that I notice in the 25 years of existence of the open source initiative is that we have, like in many other ways in software, there is a top of the spear, uh, top of the pyramid uh, set of people who really deeply understand what's happening and why and how to, to deploy, how to collaborate and how to use the licenses. There is at the bottom of the pyramid, lots of people who have just barely heard of this. They come out of college, they have played with Apache, software, they have played with uh, Linux software, but they have not really understood exactly what, what that all means and nobody taught them. So we have some catching up to do and we're gonna be doing this with thanks to contributions and donations and the uh, goodwill of, um, of Deb Bryant and Simon Phipps uh, in uh, Europe. So I was hired one year ago and I'm the first executive director of the Open Source Initiative. This means that a lot of the processes inside the organizations have, have to be created. A lot of the programs have to be reinforced. And uh, these are the three big buckets for me in 2022. And I'm glad to say that, so improving our outreach and advocacy team was one of the main things that I'm, it's in my to-do list, um, reinforcing the projects and uh, um, fixing the operations inside. And it's at the same time as building everything else. It's like, you know, fixing the plane as you're flying. So I'm, I'm happy um, about a lot of the things that we've done. So we, we managed to launch a new blog and I encourage you to look at it because it's, it's called Voices of Open Source because the intention here is to work with the community and, and make it available as a, as a platform for the community. So affiliate members, affiliate organizations, which are part of our um, network of, of friends, let's say they have access to this. And in fact, they've been, we've been publishing interviews and we're publishing stories about the affiliates, but it's also available for partners and sponsors and individual contributors within the, within the, uh, the, 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 the framework and the limitations of being a charity organization. So we cannot advertise your products, but definitely we can talk about stories of how you deployed, how you train your, your new staff, for example, new engineers, how you teach them how to use open source or how your customers are enjoying your, the fact that you are working with open source software. And the one thing that I'm really happy about is we, we removed Google Analytics from our, from our systems uh, and, and went for a European company called Plausible. Um, a new website is also under development. And, uh, and you may say, What's taking you so long? Well, well I tell them to myself, limitations. But we have, we have a good team working on this. And these are the focus areas. So for the, on the advocacy and outreach, I spoke a little bit about mentioning the AI work. Um, and uh, the, on the licenses front, I mentioned clearly, clearly defined, but there is another project that is brewing and I will announce it by the end of the year we want to streamline and, and, and simplify how the core activity of OSI uh, has been done. So licenses, right now they're published as static web pages and uh, a lot of tools out there are relying on scraping, web scraping to understand whether a license has been approved or not, which is really, really, really so 1991. Uh, we should move on. And so we have a plan uh, of action to transform this into, we're doing two things actually. One is to put the list of licenses behind an API so that tools like SPDX or um, software heritage can automatically check and deliver the information about the license, the approval of the license or not. But the other thing that we're doing is to validating that database to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Um, because you may imagine with lots of volunteers over the years maintaining that list, um, there might be uh, like one or two that have been, that have been missed. So we're going to have to hire um, some 
some contractors with with some legal knowledge to understand to go through the minutes of the of the wiki and and build a database it's going to be a little bit painful and boring but we'll do it um, and uh, the other thing that we want to do is to change how and create like a reliable archive of those decisions because the discussions and the knowledge about that the discussion when a license was reviewed are now in a very opaque i must say and and uh, loosely connected archive of of uh, mail map old piper mail archives holding the information about why a license was approved or why it was was denied approval and we need to build that kind of information back into the license text itself so that's a little bit more complicated to achieve but it's also something that we have sketched out and we will start the conversation with the community very I'm, I'm hoping as soon as we're done with um, the AI project. Um, and then going into the future, we want to change how we review licenses. Like right now, they are happening, like I said, on mailman mailing lists. It's not exactly the right way to do it. Or at least it was the right way at the time when we had, we knew no better. Uh, we didn't know better or we didn't have any sophisticated tools to do it, but we do have it now. We do have ways to annotate text and keep that for forever as archive. Um, and um, okay, so and, and these are the other, that's the other area that we're working on, on um, to, to the expansion of our policy programs, because we see the activity um, in, in uh, related to security and the fact that open source software is everywhere. Finally, policymakers in Europe and the United States are, are waking up to the, to the dependency. They need to understand what's happening and why. And we need to avoid for them to, for us, to be chasing them at the last minute to avoid them from, from, for example, banning the export of all software from one way or another. And we will be stopping collaboration that has been creating this wealth of, of, um, of software. And um, we'll do more um, I have a lot of other ideas about how we need, we want to engage with the members, with the community in general. Right now, you may have noticed on the website there isn't, there isn't, there are many ways to interact uh, between members and 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 staff, for example, or just to to collaborate. Lots of conversations happen outside, on Twitter or on different Slack channels, different IRC channels or Matrix channels. And we, we just need to have a better way to interact with each other. So it's, it's also on my radar um, and my to-do list. And on the training and education side, we do have a partnership with, a, um, we, we helped Brandeis, it's a university in the United States to create a training program for project manager, program managers to understand open source. Uh, that pro program, uh, training program has wonderful reviews. Uh, but not as many subscriptions. So we need, we're working with Brandeis to refine the way we reach out to potential trainees or people who want, or corporations rather that want to offer that as a, as a training package. So if you have, if you work at, a, at an organization and you would like to see your company offer more training to product managers, project managers about how to do collaboration in open source, it's a great program and uh, I'm welcoming um, your contacts so that I can put you in touch with the university. And I would stop here and I would take questions. I mean, I wanted this to be more of a, an interaction um, with, with you. What do you want us to do? You know, are, you, are you convinced that this is a good idea or are we missing something? Julia? Yeah. Um, would you ever be open to running such a survey and publishing data behind it? So the question is, we partnered with, uh, you're mentioning the, the one that we did last year. Mm -hmm. 
uh, um, I don't remember now. The, the, the second. No, not with someone. Oh, the partnership. No, uh, is with. Um, oh God. Um, cut this. <laughs> Um, oh my God! It's, it's okay. Um, it, was it was a survey, but it was done with with a with a with a company, and we helped them refine the questions and and distribute the results. Uh, yes, um, that that's a good question. In fact, we are in the process of reviewing the the, the questionnaire now. Um, and so, what's your what's your suggestion? What would you like to see? The raw data. Yeah. Um, I would like to know how they're reached. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, of course. There is an interpretation going behind behind the, the presentation of the results. That's a good comment. Yeah, I'll take it to the team and we'll definitely discuss that. Yeah. Thanks. So clearly defined now has, a, it's already in, in production. So it has APIs and it's got all the information from the consumption perspective. So you, you can look it up now. I think it has partnerships with a bunch of FOSSA, Fossology, um, I don't know what other, other code scanners. You can plug it in. Um, I don't know if you that's your... Canonical names for the licenses? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. For canonical names of the artifacts, so you can recognize a you know, package um, science something is actually this one corresponding. I'm I'm not sure, honestly. I'm not into the the weeds of the users of clearly defined, but that's something that we can definitely, I can bring it back to the team and, and discuss it. Because in in the end, this is all driven by adoption, right? Right now, I think it's satisfying the needs for, you know, I know that they want to fix all the time something, inside Microsoft, inside Bloomberg, but more participation and more comments. Definitely, definitely it's, uh, it's worth bringing, bringing it up. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So if, for instance, if you Right. So, okay, so if I understand correctly, your comment still, uh, it's referring to clearly defined and, and being, being carrying the information about the license and the seal of approval from those, yeah, okay. Definitely, <laughs> definitely it's something that it, it, it's nice to have. So uh, the, the community of clearly defined meets um, uh, on Discord a lot. They use it very, very heavily, uh, but they also have a presence of, on, on GitHub. So. Lots of conversations can happen there, but I will definitely relate that to Carol Smith and the others. 
leader. Yeah. Anybody doing AI here? No? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I do have some ideas. Um, I, I spoke about um, AI yesterday, but I can give you the gist. I think what's happening is that the there is a huge there is a huge push um, and and pull uh, forces. One from research and academia. They've been working on these problems, and they have been playing with small data sets, they have been playing for with small models, they have been doing so many interesting things. And uh, what's happening is that all of a sudden, there is a huge amount of data available coming from corporations or, uh, or coming from uh, groups that are capable or able to assemble these huge data sets. Huge data sets bring larger models, Larger models bring better results or faster results, and they're very exciting. This means that the, uh, the, these AI models start to become really good, really appealing. Oh, oh my God, let's put it in production. So they go into production, and they start to do damaging things at a very fast pace. So we need to, what we're trying to understand with deep dive AI Oh, I'm sorry. At, this, at the same time, the people responsible for these large models and these large data sets, they're scared. They're afraid. So my interpretation by reading the room you know, from the outside, my interpretation is that the, the fear of these models going, getting out of control is pushing them to write uh, licenses. Um, be, so releasing the code, but then writing a license that says you cannot use it to do harm. I'm being, being very blunt, but it, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. But they they understand that the AI uh, can do damage, so they, they are limiting the uses of AI, um, their, the, their AI. And so with these new licenses coming up, we're going to have more and more of those because the temptation to deploy more AI, to de deliver more AI, there will be more temptation to write contracts and write norms, write law, uh, cases, and we as the open source initiative, we need to, we want to help them. We want to help them understand the space because before you have a, a huge field of licenses and that you cannot really use because they don't, they don't enable collaboration, they don't enable sharing of information, they don't enable sharing of weights or all the pieces, the source code, whatever that is for AI. If they don't have that freedom, those freedoms, defined and clarified, the, the, the field may slow down instead of making fast progress. So it's, it's a way for us to reaching out and we're going to have in the panels to reaching out to other communities and convene a conversation on our, uh, with, with us so that we can help them. Yeah. Very much similar to the situation before or which I was from them, uh, or the situation. So can we expect and how could of we get a like similar mix as at the inside expecting them or inside definition for data? See, uh, traditionally we haven't we haven't covered data. That that was the realm of the open data movement, open knowledge movement, uh, open access movement. And in fact, that's, that's one of the challenges uh, of AI. It's that it brings together software, knowledge, data, um, and we need to think about all of that holistically. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you haven't traditionally covered data, but you do specifically cover the, the permitted uses of software. Now, AI is often involved in training on large data sets, and so the codex, which is part of the GitHub Copilot, is trained on Code. Yep. Uh, I wonder whether there's a, a gap now in software licensing in general. Um, it, the 
Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and the gap is very visible to me on the uh, images front. It's at the same, it's at the same level. I, I put my picture on Flickr a long time ago. Now my picture on Flickr a long time ago is being used to identify me on the street if I'm going for shopping or on a protest or something, right? Did I give the right? to clear view to use my picture and sell it to the NSA as a, as a model? I have not, not explicitly, but uh, at the same time, the EU has pretty much given, given a, a blank um, cover uh, defining the right to data mining. It's only available for nonprofit, uh, for research purposes, but the data set can be built upon anything that is available on the internet unless someone says no. So all the past, it's available for data mining in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Except. Yeah, it's a new it's a new right. It's like when the EU established the uh, right to databases. Yeah. So I only have one minute left. It's. Uh, I can I would continue the conversation uh, with much pleasure. Um, outside also, or over lunch or something, yeah. Because I I think that the we are at the when software was created. It's, I mean, in the eighties when the open source definition came out or the free software definition came out, software was a brand new primitive, a brand new artifact. It did not exist before, and the community of researchers in, funny enough, the AI lab at MIT. They created the social norms first. They, they saw the danger of the privatization of knowledge that go, was go, coming out of the, of the labs and getting into the private uh, enterprises. And they created the GNU Manifesto. Richard Stallman wrote it first. Then he wrote code. And then he wrote the license five years after. So I think we are at the same stage now where AI is escaping in, in the labs and getting into the in production and banks and, and governments and stuff. And now we need to establish those norms. Like what's acceptable behavior? Why is that acceptable? You know, what's the purpose of, of, uh, of having, you know, enabling sharing and stuff. With that, I got a red light. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I got stickers here if you want.